In chapter 25, we will discuss the urinary system. Urology is the branch of medicine that deals with the urinary system and male reproductive tract. The functions of the urinary system are to adjust blood volume and blood pressure, regulate plasma concentrations of sodium, potassium, chloride, as well as other ions, stabilize blood pH, excrete metabolic waste and drugs or toxins, and regulate red blood cell production, synthesize calcitrol, and perform gluconeogenesis. The basic gross anatomy of the urinary system consists of two bean-shaped kidneys that are metabolically very active. At rest, they receive 25% of the cardiac output. The kidneys perform the excretory functions of the urinary system and produce urine, a fluid containing water, ions, and small soluble compounds. Two ureters that receive urine from the kidneys and then conduct it to the urinary bladder. Urine movement involves a combination of gravity and peristalsis. The urinary bladder receives and stores urine prior to elimination from the body. The urinary bladder possesses rugae and is lined with transitional epithelium to allow the urinary bladder to stretch. The urethra drains urine from the urinary bladder and transports the urine to the outside of the body. In females, it only drains urine. In males, it drains urine and semen. At the base of the bladder, there is an internal and an external urethral sphincter that regulates urination. The physical characteristics of urine is our next topic. As you can see here from the slide, the basic physical characteristics of normal urine are shown. A healthy adult typically produces about 1,200 milliliters of urine per day with an osmotic concentration of roughly 1,000 milliosmoles per liter. Urine volumes can vary, however, between 750 to 2,000 milliliters per day. The water content of normal urine is between 93 to 97 percent water. The color should be a pale, clear yellow to deep amber color because of an abundance of a yellow pigment called urochrome. If the urine is not clear, it is described as turbid and may be suggestive of a bacterial infection. Urine should contain no bacteria when a sterile sample is collected. The odor should be slightly aromatic when fresh, but tends to develop an ammonia odor due to bacterial metabolism. And the odor can vary according to composition and diet. The pH of urine is slightly acidic, ranging normally between 4.5 to 8, but on average will be about a pH 6. The specific gravity should be between 1.003 and 1.030. The solute concentrations in plasma and urine are shown here as a reference, and you can see the difference in concentration of ions, metabolites and nutrients, and various nitrogenous waste products. Abnormal urine constituents are shown here. If glucose is present, for example, in a urine sample, it might be indicative of diabetes. 
proteins, ketone bodies, hemoglobin, bile pigments, erythrocytes, and leukocytes are also abnormal urine constituents and if present can be a sign of various diseases. Urine volumes are also shown on this slide. Polyurea is when someone has more than the normal volume of urine produced every day and can be indicative of diabetes, for example. Anorrhea is when someone is producing an abnormally low volume of urine per day and can be a sign of kidney failure, as an example. Now let's look at the gross anatomy of urine transport. The excretory system, if we examine it on a macroscopic level, we see the kidneys are located retroperitoneal on each side of the vertebral column between the 12th thoracic vertebrae and the third lumbar vertebrae. The right kidney is lower than the left one because of the liver size and position. The renal hilus is a prominent medial indentation where blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatic vessels enter and exit the kidney. The connective tissue layers of the kidney are the renal capsule, which is a layer of collagen fibers that covers the outer surface of the kidney. The renal capsule also lines the renal sinus, which is an internal cavity within the kidney. The adipose capsule is a thick middle layer of fatty tissue that insulates and cushions the kidney. The renal fascia is the outermost dense connective tissue, tissue that anchors the kidney and adrenal glands. Here we can also see some of the internal microscopic anatomy. The renal cortex is the outermost portion of the kidney and is in contact with the renal capsule. The renal cortex is light red in color and has a granular appearance. The renal medulla extends from the renal cortex to the renal sinus. The renal medulla possesses many conical shaped masses called renal pyramids, each ending in a nipple-like structure called a renal papillae. The renal columns are inward extensions of cortical tissue that separates the renal pyramids. The renal pelvis is a flat funnel-shaped tube that drains urine from the cortex and medulla towards the ureters. The minor calyx is a branch of the renal pelvis that encloses the top of a single renal pyramid. And the major calyx forms from the fusion of four or five minor calyxes. Here we can see the ureter shown on the slide demonstrating the lumen and the tissue layers surrounding the ureter. Here we can see the bladder, which is composed of transitional epithelium, along with the two ureters that enter the bladder, and the urethra, showing both the internal urethral sphincter and the external urethral sphincter of the urethra. The female and male urethras are shown here. The male urethra is much longer than the female urethra 
which makes women more susceptible to urinary tract infections because the bacteria do not have as far to travel in a woman versus a man. The male urethra is also divided into sections with the prosthetic urethra, the membranous urethra, and the penile or spongy urethra. You will learn more about the different parts of the male urethra when you study the male and female reproductive tracts in a later chapter. Here we can see the nerves innervating the urinary system. In particular, the pudundal nerve is shown on the slide. Now let's look at the gross anatomy of the kidneys. Here we can see the two kidneys and the fat that surrounds them, which is not shown, provides additional protection. And you can also see the placement of the kidneys as noted previously in their retroperitoneal position of the body. The internal anatomy of the kidney is shown here. And you can see the cortex, renal medulla, and renal pelvis, which outlines the major and minor calyxes, as well as the renal hilum, which is the medial indentation where the renal nerve, artery and vein, and ureter enters and exits the kidney. Here is another view of the internal anatomy of the kidneys from a human kidney shown on the slide. Blood flow in the kidney is shown here and there is a blood supply review link that you may review on your own. Blood flow to the kidney is provided by the renal arteries which enter the kidney at the renal hilus to bring oxygenated unfiltered blood into the kidney. The renal arteries branch into smaller and smaller vessels in the following order. The first branch is the segmental artery, next interlobar artery, then arcuate, then cortical radiate, which is also known as interlobular, then the afferent arterial into the glomerulus, which is the first capillary bed, out the efferent arterioles, and then into the peritubular capillaries, or the vasa recta capillaries, which are the second capillary bed. The second capillary beds will transport clean, deoxygenated blood to the veins and out of the kidneys in the following sequence. The cortical radiate veins or interlobular vein, then the arcuate veins, interlobar veins, and then finally renal veins to the inferior vena cava. Note there is no segmental veins. Now let's look at the microscopic anatomy of the kidney. Here we can see the two types of nephrons. The nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. Each kidney contains approximately 1.25 million nephrons with a combined length of around 85 miles. There are two types of nephrons. Cortical nephrons, which comprise about 85% of the nephrons in the human body, are located almost entirely in the cortex and are responsible for most of the regulatory functions of the kidneys. Wrapped 
by a peritubular capillary bed which reabsorbs nutrients that were inadvertently filtered as a component of the filtrate. The peritubular capillaries tend to primarily surround the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule. The juxtamedullary nephrons, which comprise about 15% of the nephrons in the human body, have long loops of Henle that deeply invade into the medulla. These nephrons are associated with vasorecta and the production of concentrated urine as they tend to be long, straight capillaries that surround the loops of Henle rather than the proximal convoluted tubule and distal convoluted tubule as the cortical nephrons do. And here you can see the blood flow in the nephron as previously described. The juxtaglomerular apparatus and glomerulus are shown here. The glomerulus is the first capillary bed composed of fenestrated capillaries which are exceptionally porous, allowing large amounts of solutes to pass from blood and into the surrounding Bowman's capsule. The substance removed from blood is called filtrate. And here you can see a picture of those fenestrated capillaries. The podocytes are large cells located in the visceral layer of Bowman's capsule, which possess complex foot processes called pedicles. These wrap densely around the glomerulus, creating filtration slits that limit the movement of large materials out of the blood and into Bowman's capsule. The collecting ducts carry tubular fluids through the osmotic gradient in the renal medulla and make final adjustments in the volume and osmotic concentrations in the urine. Now let's take a look at urine production. Urine production is the production of urine which involves three main processes. Glomerular non-selective filtration which occurs at the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule. Tubular reabsorption which occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, and the first part of the distal convoluted tubule, and tubular secretion which occurs mostly in the proximal convoluted tubule for most materials, but not in the distal convoluted tubule for potassium. Beginning with non-selective filtration, unfiltered blood in the afferent arterioles enters the glomerulus. Pretty much anything small enough except for blood cells and plasma proteins, is forced into Bowman's capsule as the filtrate. The efferent arterioles transport filtered blood away from the glomerulus towards the second capillary bed, either the peritubular capillary bed or the vasorecta. The glomerulus is a unique capillary bed because arterioles move blood into the capillary bed and transport blood away from the capillary bed. Almost all other capillary beds in the body have venules taking blood away from the capillary bed. The glomerular filtration rate is the amount of filtrate formed in both kidneys per minute. In a healthy individual, the kidneys filter about 1,200 milliliters of blood through the nephron per minute. As a result 
of the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, approximately 125 milliliters of filtrate are produced per minute. The majority of this, around 124 milliliters, is reabsorbed in the renal tubule portion of the nephron. Therefore, only about one milliliter of urine is produced for each 125 milliliters of glomerular filtrate. The glomerular hydrostatic pressure, or GHP, generates a push out of the glomerulus and into Bowman's capsule so that water and solutes are forced out of the plasma and into the filtrate. The blood colloid osmotic pressure generates a suction into the glomerulus so that water and solutes are drawn out of the filtrate and into the plasma. The capsular hydrostatic pressure generates a push out of Bowman's capsule and into the glomerulus so that water and solutes are forced out of the filtrate and into the plasma. The capsular colloid osmotic pressure generates a suction into Bowman's capsule which draws water and solutes out of the glomerulus from the plasma and into the filtrate. The overall net filtration pressure or NFP is the difference between the forces favoring filtration. So NFP is equal to glomerular hydrostatic pressure minus the blood colloid osmotic pressure minus the capsular hydrostatic pressure minus the capsular colloid osmotic pressure. NFP is generally a positive number and as such indicates a net movement of materials out of the glomerulus and into Bowman's capsule. The net movement out is called filtration. Urine volume and concentration is hormonally regulated. One of those hormones is renin. Renin is produced by the juxtaglomerular cells of the renal corpuscle and angiotensin II. Renin release is triggered by a drop in blood pressure causing angiotensin I to be converted to angiotensin II, which is a potent vasoconstrictor in the lungs. Angiotensin II constricts the capillaries forming the glomerulus, which results in less filtrate production, which in turn raises blood volume and therefore raises blood pressure. ADH is another hormone that contributes to urine volume and concentration. Antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, is produced by the hypothalamus and secreted by the posterior pituitary gland. This hormone plays a role in water reabsorption at the distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts. If we have an increased ADH secretion, it will increase water reabsorption, which in turn means less urine is produced. Now let's look at tubular reabsorption and secretion. As the glomerular filtrate enters the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, and the first part of the distal convoluted tubule, Water, ions, and other substances are reabsorbed into the blood via the second capillary bed called the peritubular capillary bed. Most substances, such as urea, 
fat-soluble vitamins and some drugs simply diffuse from the tubule lumen directly into the peritubular capillary bed. Ions may be reabsorbed through a combination of simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, active transport, or secondary active transport. Along the proximal convoluted tubule, approximately 108 liters out of about 180 liters of filtrate produced per day is reabsorbed from the tubular fluid. And here you can see what is exactly being reabsorbed by the proximal convoluted tubule. 99 to 100% of filtered organic compounds are reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. About 80% of filtered bicarb is reabsorbed. 60 to 70% of filtered water is reabsorbed. 65% of filtered sodium and filtered chloride is reabsorbed here. Although most reabsorption occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule, the filtrate now enters the loop of Henle, and we will examine where water reabsorption and solute reabsorption occurs in the loop of Henle next. And here you can see some of those substances that are reabsorbed and secreted by the proximal convoluted tubule along with bicarb. Now let's look at the loop of Henle, which is also known as the countercurrent multiplier. When the filtrate enters the loop of Henle, water reabsorption continues on the descending portion and solute reabsorption, in particular sodium, occurs in the in the ascending portion. Only about 15 to 20 percent of the initial filtrate volume reaches the distal convoluted tubule. And as you can see here, since one side of the loop of Henle is permeable to water and the other side is only permeable to salt, the concentration of the urine increases dramatically as the tubular fluid moves through the loop of Henle and then becomes diluted as it goes up the ascending loop of Henle. And here you can see the major reabsorption of solutes, sodium and chloride and water. Now in the distal convoluted tubule, the concentrations of electrolytes and organic waste um, no longer resembles the concentration of blood plasma. In the distal convoluted tubule, a combination of reabsorption and secretion further alters the solute concentration of the tubular fluid. Furthermore, the volume and osmotic concentrations of the tubular fluid can be further adjusted by the collecting ducts. Here we can have variable amounts of reabsorption regulated by antidiuretic hormone, and we can have variable amounts of sodium and chloride regulated by aldosterone. Aldosterone promotes the reabsorption of sodium ions and excretion of potassium ions. So for example, a low blood sodium concentration would cause the adrenal cortex to increase the secretion of aldosterone. The aldosterone causes more sodium to be reabsorbed into the bloodstream. Excess blood sodium levels will inhibit aldosterone secretion and therefore sodium reabsorption is shut down so that sodium will be lost in the urine.
the collecting duct can vary in the amounts of water reabsorption, also regulated by ADH, and variable amounts of sodium and chloride regulated by aldosterone. Now, the water permeability of the proximal convoluted tubule and loop of Henle cannot be adjusted, and water reabsorption occurs whenever the osmotic concentration of the peritubular fluid exceeds that of the tubular fluid. Because these water movements cannot be prevented, they are known as obligatory water reabsorption. Obligatory reabsorption usually recovers 85% of the volume of filtrate produced. The volume of water lost in urine depends on how much water in the remaining tubular fluid is reabsorbed along the distal convoluted tubule and collecting ducts. And the amount can be precisely controlled by a process called facultative water reabsorption. Most facultative water reabsorption is regulated by the hormone ADH, which is produced in the hypothalamus and secreted by the posterior pituitary gland. Now let's look at regulation of blood flow and kidney function. Here we can see the major hormones that influence the glomerular filtration rate and blood flow. Vasoconstrictors such as angiotensin II, which we have previously talked about, are shown here and their effect on GFR and renal blood flow. There are also vasodilators such as prostaglandins, nitric oxide, and ANP. Atrial natriuretic peptide is a hormone produced by the atria of the heart, which inhibits the secretion of aldosterone, thereby promoting the excretion of sodium and ultimately the reabsorption of potassium. Therefore, ANP acts as a diuretic. So the hormones to be familiar with that we've talked about are antidiuretic, aldosterone, atrial natriuretic peptide, and renin and angiotensin II. And here we can see the enzyme renin and the process of converting the proenzyme angiotensin. Remember, renin is produced by the juxtaglomerular cells of the renal corpuscle. And angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzyme ACE, ACE produced in the lungs. And angiotensin 2 is a very potent vasoconstrictor of the body. Now let's examine regulation of fluid volume and comp composition. The volume of fluid produced by the kidneys and the composition of urine can be regulated by diuretics or by regulating certain ions such as sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, hydrogen ions, and bicarb. And we have previously discussed how certain hormones in the body, such as antidiuretic, aldosterone, ANP, can have an impact on the regulation of certain ions in the composition of our final urine produced. Diuretics would be the opposite of antidiuretic hormone and allow us to excrete a very dilute urine by increasing the volume of water lost from the body. Nitrogenous waste products will also vary in the composition of our urine and these can vary based on our diet or even certain medications that we're taking. 
Finally, let's talk about homeostasis of the urinary system. Now, the functions of the urinary system were mentioned at the beginning of this chapter and are reiterated here. The urinary system is responsible for producing red blood cells, regulating our blood pressure, uh, varying the osmolarity of our blood, recovery of electrolytes, and even regulating pH as well as participating in vitamin D synthesis. So the urinary system has many important functions that contribute to the overall homeostasis of the body. There are, however, several homeostatic imbalances that can occur, and some of those are shown here for you. Polyurea is an excess urinary output, usually greater than 2,500 milliliters per day. This may result from hormonal or metabolic problems, such as those associated with diabetes or glomerular nephritis. Diabetes insipidus is the production of large quantities of urine, resulting in severe dehydration and intense thirst. This can also occur as a result of low antidiuretic hormone release. Oligourea is a very low urine output, usually around 300 to 500 milliliters per day. Anorrhea, severely low urinary output, ranging anywhere from 50 milliliters or less per day. And this may be a result of injury, a transfusion reaction, or low blood pressure, for example. Dysuria is painful or difficult urination and can occur with cystitis or urethritis or with urinary obstructions. In men, an enlarged prostate gland can compress the urethra and lead to this condition. Um, urethritis is inflammation of the urethra. Pyelonephritis, infection or inflammation of the kidney. Polycystic kidney, an inherited condition that results in urine-filled cyst forming within the kidney. Renal calculi are kidney stones. Renal infarct is an area of dead necrotic renal tissue, cystitis, inflammation of the bladder, incontinence is an inability to control urination voluntarily and may involve periodic leakage or the inability to delay urination or can even be a continual slow trickle of urine from the bladder that is always full. And urinary retention. This is the inability to expel urine even though renal function is normal. This is also common in males with an enlarged prostate gland. This concludes our overview of the urinary system.